Okay, so you wanted to really dig into this Vance Walsh debate, right? Get into the weeds and see what's actually there. Well, let me tell you, this one, this one surprised me a bit. It really does make you think twice about all that politics is just a blood sport stuff we hear all the time. No kidding. It was almost shockingly civil, especially given, well, everything. You've got an election year, two guys with totally opposite views, and they're actually being, like, respectful on national TV, no less. It's almost like a throwback, right? Like, remember when politicians could disagree without acting like they wanted to destroy each other? I know. Makes you wonder if maybe, just maybe, there's hope for political discourse after all. Or maybe it was just a temporary truce for the cameras. Who knows? Well, and the report even called out how rare this kind of debate has become. It's like they felt the need to point out that, hey, civility still exists, at least for one night. Right. Which actually makes it even more interesting to unpack, don't you think? Like, what's the strategy there? Exactly. And it's not like either of these guys are known for shying away from a fight. Seriously. I mean, Vance even, get this, he even pronounced Kamala Harris's name correctly. Which, let's be honest, in this day and age, that's practically a news headline. Right. Mm -hmm. Sad but true. But, okay, before we get too distracted by the quote-unquote civility of it all, let's not forget this was still a debate. And there were definitely some moments where things got a little, shall we say, heated. Oh, absolutely. That whole back and forth about January 6th, that's where the gloves really came off. Totally. You could just feel the tension in the air when Walls pressed Vance on whether Trump actually lost in 2020. Like, just answer the question, man. But of course he didn't, did he? Instead, we got this whole song and dance about moving forward and not dwelling on the past. It was almost painful to watch. Talk about dodging a question. I mean, come on, you can't just ignore reality and hope it goes away, although some politicians seem to have made that their entire platform. It's that classic political tightrope, isn't it? Trying to appease the base without alienating everyone else. Tough needle to thread. And Vance, well, let's just say he didn't exactly stick the landing on that one. He even tried to deflect by bringing up Hillary Clinton in her comments after the 2016 election, as if those two things are even remotely comparable. It's the oldest trick in the book. Create a false equivalency, muddy the waters, and hope nobody notices you're not actually answering the question. Classic. But Walls wasn't having it. He shut that down so fast. He did not hold back. The report even mentions how he brought up the police officers who were injured and killed on January 6th. Yeah, like a reality check for anyone trying to downplay what happened that day. Exactly. Like, this wasn't just some abstract political debate. It had real-world consequences. People were hurt. Some even died. It was a really powerful moment, and it kind of set the tone for the rest of the debate, didn't it? Definitely. Like, okay, we can be polite, we can be civil, but let's not pretend we're not on completely opposite sides of some really fundamental issues. Right. It's like watching a family holiday dinner where everyone's pretending to get along, but you can just tell there's some serious tension simmering beneath the surface. You nailed it. And speaking of simmering tension, did you catch that part where Vance, like, complimented Wallace's ideas? Sort of. Oh, you mean the whole halfway decent comment? Exactly. Like, is that the best you can do? Halfway decent. It's such a classic politician move. Throw in a tiny little compliment to make it seem like you're being reasonable, but then immediately pivot to an attack. And of course, the attack was on Kamala Harris. Because why not? Right. Got to get those jabs in while you can. Right. But it does make you wonder, is genuine civility even possible in politics anymore? Or is it always going to be this kind of strategic, calculated performance? I mean, it was fascinating to see how they handled things like immigration. That got a little spicy. You mean when they somehow ended up talking about Springfield, Ohio? Springfield, of all places. Right, like you'd think we were talking about immigration in L.A. or New York or something, but nope, Springfield. It's not exactly a global metropolis known for its diverse population, is it? Not exactly. But that's where Vance decided to make his point. The report talked about how he'd been making these claims about Haitian immigrants in Springfield. And get this, he actually said they were eating people's pets. Eating pets. Okay, now that just sounds made up. I know, right? Oh, like, no. come on. But that's the kind of rhetoric he was using. So did he try to, like, double down on that during the debate? Surprisingly, no. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine trying to defend that on national TV? Not really, although some politicians might try. True enough. But Vance, he took a different approach. He started talking about how immigrants were putting a strain on resources in Springfield schools, hospitals, that kind of thing. Even mentioned crime, which the report actually pointed out has been going down in Springfield, not up. So it was kind of a classic case of cherry picking data to fit a narrative. Exactly. And it's a reminder that even in a relatively civil debate, 
you still have to be really careful about the claims being made and whether they actually hold up to scrutiny. It's like that saying, numbers don't lie, but liars can figure, or something like that. Exactly. And it's a tactic that works, unfortunately. People latch on to these anecdotes, these little stories, even if they're not entirely accurate, because they confirm what they already believe. And we can't forget, the report made it very clear those Haitian immigrants in Springfield, they're in the U.S. legally. Right. Which makes the whole argument about unchecked illegal immigration a bit moot, doesn't it? Just a tad. But, okay, so it sounds like we've got civility, we've got dog whistle politics, we've got questionable statistics. Are we sure this debate was as tame as we initially thought? Well, like we said, it's complicated. On the surface, yeah, they were being pretty polite, but then you had these moments where the real, much more ruthless game was playing out underneath. And it wasn't just about Springfield. This whole exchange fed into a much bigger disagreement about immigration policy overall. Right, because it's never really just about one town, is it? It always comes back to the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So how did their different views on immigration actually play out in the debate? Well, Vance took a pretty hard line, like a lot of Republicans. Mm -hmm. He talked about the need for stricter border security, more enforcement, you know, the drill. And walls. Walls was more focused on addressing what he called the root causes of migration. Like why people are leaving their home countries in the first place? Exactly. He talked about things like poverty, violence, climate change, yeah. argued that we need to invest in Central America if we really want to solve this problem long term. Which you have to admit is a pretty different approach from just building a bigger wall. Definitely. And it's a debate that's been going on for decades with no easy answers. And unfortunately, it doesn't sound like this debate really offered any groundbreaking solutions either. Not really. But to be fair, that's often the nature of these things, isn't it? They're more about scoring political points than actually delving into the nitty gritty of policy solutions. True enough. But hey, at least we got a little glimpse of civility along the way. Okay, so besides immigration, what other controversies did they manage to quote unquote, politely disagree on? Well, things took an interesting turn when the conversation shifted from immigration to Walls' own travel history, specifically his trips to China. China. Okay, now that's a curveball I wasn't expecting. What's the deal with Walls in China? So it's not so much about business dealings or anything like that, more about his travel history. Seems there were some discrepancies. Discrepancies. Yeah, leading up to the debate, there were these reports, specifically from Minnesota Public Radio News and APM reports, they were questioning Walsh's claims about how many times he had actually been to China. He previously said something like 30 times. 30. That's a lot of trips to China. Like, what was he doing over there that often? That's what these reports were trying to figure out. And it gets even more interesting. They also questioned whether Walsh was actually in Hong Kong during the Tiananmen Square protests back in 89, which he had previously claimed. Oof. Yeah. You definitely don't want to get that detail wrong. No, not at all. <laughs> so naturally, it came up during the debate. Everyone was waiting to see how he'd handle it. So did he come clean? Did he give a straight answer? Initially, he kind of danced around it. You know, that classic political move of talking about everything but the actual question. But eventually, he admitted to misspeaking about the number of trips. Misspeaking, the politician's favorite word. Right. Though, to be fair. A spokesperson for the Harris campaign later clarified that it was probably closer to 15 trips. Still a lot, but, you know, not quite 30. Yeah, but the damage was done, right? I'm sure Vance's team was already cutting attack ads about Walsh's China lies or something. Oh, for sure. He did get a little dig in later with something like, when you misspeak, you owe it to the American people to be honest about that. But honestly, I'm surprised he didn't hammer it home more. Maybe he figured the seed of doubt was already planted. No need to overdo it. Could be. But speaking of deeply held beliefs, let's move on to another topic where they really diverged. Abortion. Ah, uh, yes. The issue that just keeps on giving in American politics. So where did they stand on that one? It really came down to a fundamental difference in how they view the role of government. You know, Vance, as you might expect, leaned heavily on the state's rights argument. Said abortion should be left up to individual states. Which is essentially how Roe v. Wade got overturned in the first place, right? Mm, exactly. And it's a line that resonates with a lot of voters, especially those who feel like the federal government has gotten too big, too powerful. Right. It's about personal freedom, individual liberty, that kind of thing. Exactly. Vance also talked about the need for Republicans to do more to support families, like making fertility treatments more affordable, addressing the housing crisis, 
that sort of thing. Interesting. So it's not just about restricting abortion. It's about promoting a broader vision of what they consider pro-family policies. Right. More of a holistic approach, at least in theory. OK, so what about Walls? How did he counter that? Walls took a more human rights focused approach, mm -hmm. argued that access to abortion is a fundamental right, shouldn't matter where you live. He even brought up the issue of maternal mortality rates, which have actually been going up in states with more restrictive abortion laws. Yeah, that's a pretty sobering statistic. It is. And he used it to really drive home the point that these bans have real world consequences. He also directly addressed those claims from the Trump camp that he's pro late term abortion. Which, to be clear, is something that comes up in pretty much every election cycle. Like clockwork. Yeah. And Walls called it out as a blatant falsehood. Pretty bold move, actually, to directly challenge that kind of rhetoric. It is. But sometimes you got to call out BS when you see it, right? Exactly. And speaking of BS, you're not going to believe this one. Walls actually claimed that the Trump campaign and the Heritage Foundation were planning to create a registry of pregnancies. Whoa, hold on. A pregnancy registry? That sounds... I don't know, a little dystopian, to say the least. It does, doesn't it? Turns out that was a bit of an exaggeration. Oh. Yeah. The Heritage Foundation had put forward a proposal for the CDC to collect more data on abortions, but it wasn't about creating some government list of pregnant women. Okay, so a little bit of a misfire on Walsh's part then. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah. And Vance didn't let him get away with it. But still, yeah. it's interesting how that claim, even if it wasn't entirely accurate, tapped into those very real anxieties people have about government overreach and data privacy. For sure. Those are big issues, and they're not going away anytime soon. Okay, so we've covered immigration. We've talked about China. We've discussed abortion. What else did they manage to civilly disagree on? Believe it or not, they actually found some common ground on gun violence. Now, that's surprising. Gun control always feels like one of those lose-lose issues in politics. It does, doesn't it? But in this case... Both candidates at least acknowledge that gun violence is a serious problem in this country, especially in schools. OK, so they agree there's a problem. That's a start. It's something, right? Baby steps, I guess. Hmm. Of course, the agreement pretty much stopped there. Right, because acknowledging a problem is the easy part. It's finding solutions everyone can agree on. That's the real challenge. Exactly. And that's where we saw those partisan lines reemerge. Vance, predictably, tried to tie gun violence to immigration argued that a more secure border would lead to safer streets. And walls. Walls pushed back on that, of course, and instead focused on the role of easy access to guns. You know, the classic argument that if guns are the problem, then maybe we should, you know, do something about the guns. <laughs> right. Which, of course, is a whole other debate for another day. But it's interesting how this idea of mental health always seems to get brought up in these discussions, as if it's the root of all gun violence, which, let's be honest, is a dangerous oversimplification. Absolutely. And it often feels like a way to deflect from having a real conversation about gun control. But look, we could spend a whole episode just unpacking the complexities of gun violence in America. Multiple episodes, probably. But alas, we are nearing the end of our time here. So I have to ask, after all of this, do you think this Vance Walsh debate was actually a sign of things to come? Like, is there hope for civility in politics after all? Honestly, I don't know. Part of me wants to be optimistic to believe that maybe, just maybe, this could be a turning point. But then I remember everything else that's going on in the world, all the division and anger and distrust. It's hard to stay optimistic sometimes, isn't it? But hey, maybe that's all the more reason to keep having these conversations, to keep pushing for something better, even if it feels impossible. I'm with you on that, because at the end of the day, these issues we've been talking about, they matter. They affect all of us. And if we can't even have a civil conversation about them, what hope is there for actually solving them? Exactly. So to our listeners out there, the next time you see a headline that makes you want to scream, take a deep breath. And remember, there's always more to the story. Don't just react. Engage. Think critically. And most importantly, talk to each other. You might be surprised by what you learn.